Good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you to the My Horse University live webinar on feeding horses through the winter. Our presenter today is Dr. Christine Skelly from Michigan State University. Christine is the founder and the director of My Horse University, an online horse management program based out of Michigan State University Extension. She is also the campus coordinator of the MSU Extension equine team, which strives to develop adult educational programs and serve as a resource for youth activities here in Michigan. Dr. Skelly is also a consultant to specialists, industry professionals, and horse owners in Michigan, and works closely with our Michigan Horse Council. Some of her specific interests include equine nutrition, facility design and management, and environmental stewardship. As we go through the webinar today, uh, you may ask questions using the Q&A feature that you will find at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, just roll your mouse over the bottom of the screen and your uh, features there will appear. So you can just click on the Q&A and type in your question. If you are having any problems viewing the presentation today up at the top of the screen, you should see some view options and you can change your options there as well. The webinar today is being recorded and will be posted on the My Horse University YouTube channel and on our website at myhorseuniversity.com. And with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Skelly. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, our webinar on feeding horses through the winter. And here in Michigan, we're, we're really just kicking off a real winter, <laughs> as far as a lot of us are concerned. Uh, up till, up till uh, February, we had a pretty mild go of it. And uh, now it's starting to kick in a little bit more with a little bit heavier snowfall. Um, today, as I'm looking out my window, um, it's kind of icy snow, uh, temperature of 34 degrees Fahrenheit. But due to the uh, wind chill factor, it uh, feels like 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So a little nippy and a little dank when you uh, go outside. So an overview of today's presentation, we're going to talk about uh, horses uh, critical temperature uh, for uh, low or cold temperatures outside. We're all, we'll also talk about winter dehydration uh winter starvation as well as body condition scoring your horse during the winter time uh, and then we'll uh, end things up with uh talking about forage forage alternatives and uh, how to use a ration balancer in a all hay diet so with that we will get started if you've got any questions um we uh uh, either Gwen will um, uh, let me know or we will wait until the end of the presentation, but feel free if there's something that needs clarification as we're going through this presentation, uh, just give a shout out in the chat box and uh, Glenn, Gwen will uh, uh, let me know that there's a question in. So we'll start out with what is the lower critical temperature for horses? And uh, on average, that is about uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the United States. Now, again, that's an average. There's a lot of different factors that come into play. And when we talk about lower critical temperature, we're simply talking about uh, when temperatures get cold enough that a horse has to use energy to stay warm. Um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. So some factors that will affect a horse's uh, lower critical temperature, temperature is just what are they used to? So if we have horses here in Michigan, their lower critical temperature will potentially be uh, 35 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit versus a horse that's uh, down in South Texas or in Florida their lower critical temperature may be 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so because the horse in the uh, hotter climate isn't as accustomed to the cold, it doesn't take uh, real low temperatures to get that horse um, feeling the effects of the uh, temperature drop and needing to uh, build on uh, energy reserves to, st to uh, stay warm. 
Now, when we move horses from a southern climate to a warmer climate, it doesn't take that long for them to get acclimated um, as long as there's a few factors that come into play. In fact, we usually say that it takes a horse about three to four weeks to get acclimated uh, to a new climate. But along with that, uh, we need a horse, uh, they're going uh, from uh, outdoor pasture in the south to outdoor pasture in the uh, north, they're obviously going to need a thick winter hair coat. And it may be, it may take that horse another year to where they really are um, able to switch gears and grow more of a winter hair coat uh, that's suitable for up north clim climates. Another thing that we'll take into consideration with um, a horse's lower critical temperature is how much conditioning or body fat do they have. Um, if a horse is really thin, their lower critical temperature will actually be quite a bit higher. Uh, so let's say that a horse in a moderate or a body condition score of five has a lower critical temperature of 40. If that horse is thin, uh, body condition score of three, uh, then their lower critical temperature is going to be closer to uh, 50. Um, so it's not going to take them very long uh, of a temperature drop to start really feeling the effects of the cold temperature. Another uh, factor that we'd consider is age. And when we look at age in uh, lower critical temperature, we're looking at either really older horses or really young horses. So our really older horses um, just are gonna have a little bit of a harder time staying warm. So they're gonna get cold a little quicker at higher uh, temperatures uh, than a horse uh, that's not in their late teens uh, or 20s. By the same token, a, um, a young foal, due to their smaller body mass, is going to need more energy to stay warm as well. So those are two factors we want to consider uh, in the winter is our really older horses and our young horses. Now that's not to say that young horses and older horses won't benefit from being outside in the winter. It just means that we need to make sure that they have adequate shelter and, uh, and food uh, to uh, keep warm. When we go and look at the uh, last factor, we're looking uh, more at shelter uh, from the wind and uh, any kind of moisture that might accumulate in the winter time. So a horse can withstand uh, really cold temperatures as long as they have a good windbreak, uh, as well as they can get away from um, sleet and freezing rain. Once their uh, hair coat gets damp and wet, it's no longer uh, gonna be able to insulate them uh, against uh, the cold air. So a shelter could mean just a three-sided shed uh, that's facing away from the prevailing winds, um, or it could even mean a really uh, dense tree line uh, where horses can seek, seek shelter. So there's various uh, ways we can uh, help horses uh, maintain their body temperature uh, through making sure they're acclimated, make sure they carry enough body stores of fat, um, uh, take a little extra precaution with our really old or really young horses, and making sure that they have uh, some sort of shelter from the uh, wind uh, and uh, the moisture that accumulates in the winter. So if you ask a veterinarian as the temperatures drop what they are most dreading in their practice, most of them will say uh, colics in horses. And the reason is uh, primarily due to uh, colics, uh, due to impaction colics. So um, horses are just like people. If you'll notice, at least I notice a lot, my water intake really decreases as the uh, temperatures drop. Um, in the summer, I'm outside, I'm, you know, 
doing quite a bit more in the heat and I'm more conscientious and thirsty uh, as far as drinking a lot of water. In the winter time, I really have to force myself. I have to fill uh, my water jug up and make myself drink that uh, water all throughout the day. Horses are kind of the same way. Um, with the lower temperatures, their thirst mechanism is going to uh, decrease. Um, but they still need adequate water, about 10 to 12 gallons per day uh, to do well. We need to consider uh, that snow is not an adequate uh, water source. Um, even though horses in, uh, in the wild may depend on, on snow as a water source, uh, it's really not gonna be adequate for hydrating horses over a long period of time. Um, and a lot of our more pampered horses don't really know how to uh, take in snow anyway. The other uh, concern that we have in the winter with our water sources is the water temperature. So extremely cold water temperatures can also reduce a horse's intake. Um, horses prefer uh, not really warm water in the winter, but just more of a moderate temperate type temperature, especially our older horses, because as their teeth wear down, they're just more sensitive to extreme temperatures. Uh, you can kind of think if you've got a sore tooth and you uh, drink something really cold, uh, how that kind of irritates or hurts that tooth. Uh, the same thing will go on uh, for our older horses. So it's important to make sure that they have uh, comfortable drinking water uh, in front of them at all times. Another factor you want to consider is that horses will drink um, after they eat. Um, pretty much immediately after taking in a grain meal and then an hour or so after taking in a, a meal of hay. Um, so you want to make sure that at the very minimum, they have plenty of fresh water um, at those points in time. I know sometimes um, uh, in some severe uh, cases, uh, water buckets may freeze and you may be uh, taking out uh, fresh water to horses, um, you know, two or three times a day. You want to make sure if you are doing that, that those horses have that fresh water after they eat because they uh, will want to, they'll be a little bit uh, more thirsty. So you have a window of opportunity uh, to help make sure those horses get enough water for the day. Again, uh, dehydration in the wintertime is one of the leading causes of impaction colics. Uh, in the horse. And if you think about it, there's some other factors coming into play. If you've had a horse on fresh pasture during the summer and spring and you transition over to uh, hay, uh, your pasture grasses are going to have uh, between 70-80% moisture, whereas your hay is only going to have about 10% moisture. So already you're restricting their, uh, their uh, moisture or water intake by what we're feeding them. And then top it off on that, uh, the horses just aren't as thirsty because it's not as warm outside. So you really need to make sure uh, that they have ad adequate water. One way we can try to increase the horse's thirst mechanism in the winter time is to make sure they have salt in their diet during the winter. We know it's really important in the summertime uh, that horses have access to salt in their feed because they're gonna lose a lot of salt in their sweat. But the same token goes into play in the wintertime. Uh, salt will help uh, increase their thirst mechanism. So even if you just take a tablespoon of uh, plain old table salt uh, that's on your, uh, breakfast table and put that in their uh, feed twice a day, uh, that will be enough to uh, help increase their thirst drive and uh, make sure that they're drinking their water. Hey Chris, um, we've had a couple questions that have come in the sure. Q&A. So um, one was just more of a comment that um, their horses have really decreased their intake of water this winter. They've um, seen a change there. Yep. And then um, the other one, uh, the person mentions that they have an open tank 
with a heater on all the time. And are there any suggestions for trying to increase the intake of water? Again, I think probably uh, the biggest uh, the biggest thing from that standpoint is to uh, make sure that they have salt in the diet. Um, that will help uh, increase their intake. Um, something else uh, when you when we're keeping horses outside we need to make sure that they can actually get to that water tank i know um here in michigan uh you know we we're going back and forth from uh, snow to rain and back to snow um so what will happen is if there's uh water standing around you know around that tank it gets really slippery a lot of horses are just more reluctant to walk on the hard icy surface um or if um uh, uh, there's a lot of manure piles that get real icy and hard. They don't like walking on that either. So we want to make sure that that outdoor water source is in a place where they can get to it very comfortably, um, especially your older horses. I think that becomes even more of a factor. Um, but other than that, um, there is some there is some research out there that suggests that horses on a high forage diet will take in more water uh, than horses that are fed uh, more grain, a higher grain uh, ration. Uh, so that's something else to consider as we um, talk about forage here in a minute. Those are, those are great. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, the next uh, condition we'll talk about is winter starvation. And um, as we talk about uh, horses uh, in the winter time, uh, they will expend a lot of energy trying to stay warm, especially if they're going into the winter without a whole lot of uh, body conditioning or fat stores um, on them. So it's important uh, to check on these horses and i think in the winter time especially with older horses you need to physically body condition score those horses um, every other week uh, because our older horses can go down really fast in the winter time it doesn't take long at all in a matter of weeks uh, they can drop one uh, to two body condition scores um, and the reason i say you need to physically uh, monitor their body condition is because that winter hair coat can cover up ribs pretty easily. Um, so you need to actually put your hands on, over the horse's rib cage, on top of their back, on top of their neck, uh, flush with their shoulder um, to feel uh, what that horse's body condition score is. So if we're looking at body condition scoring, um, we're looking at over the top of a horse's neck, a horse will uh, store body fat uh, uh, right behind their shoulder. They'll tend to uh, store body fat. Over their rib cage, uh, they'll store fat and along their top line or their uh, croup and butt area, uh, we'll see some uh, body fat stored. So when we're, uh, when we're looking at the scale of body condition scoring, uh, for horses, we have a scale of one through nine, uh, with one being an extremely thin horse. And, and these are horses, you know, that um, uh, probably aren't gonna make it. And then a nine, uh, extremely fat horses. And these are horses that have so much conditioning over the top of their back that when it rains, there's a pool of water standing on top of their back uh, where their crease is. Most of the time, we're trying to keep our horses at a body condition score of five, which is a nice moderate body condition score. There's enough uh, body fat there for energy when, uh, when we're riding them are they exercising enough body fat uh, to keep them warm, um, but it's not excessive to where we're uh, uh, having these horses in a position where they could easily uh, go into a metabolic uh, disorder. 
So again, uh, the fat body condition, if we're body condition scoring these horses, we're gonna have a crease, we'll see a crease down their back or be able to feel it in the winter time. Uh, their neck may appear crusty. Uh, they'll have patches of fat over the top of their um, tail head. And if we feel the, uh, feel the side of their ribs, uh, it's gonna feel, we're not gonna be able to feel any ribs, okay? So we could, we could dig pretty deep and still not really feel any ribs on that horse. And I'm gonna go back a slide here. Um, if we're looking at a horse uh, that has a thin body condition score, uh, as we, um, they're gonna be sharper over the top of their neck. Uh, we won't feel any fat over their tail head. Uh, we'll see a inverted uh, or a, a, T, a TP type shape uh, to their um, top line and really sharp weathers. And then when we feel them over the ribs, if you were to make a fist and run your fingers over the top of your uh, knuckles, that is what their rib cage would feel like. So even if winter hair is covering up their ribs to where we can't see them, uh, we can very, very easily feel each distinctive rib jutting out. If we're um, looking at a, uh, oops, looking at a horse uh, with a more um, moderate body condition score, uh, we're gonna be able to feel the ribs, uh, but it's still uh, gonna be less distinct than a horse that's thin. Um, and the back will be more level instead of having a crease. Um, and uh, we'll feel just a little bit of uh, fat over the top of the neck, um, but it won't be uh, crusty at all. So again, uh, when we're body condition scoring our um, horses, we need to feel beneath the winter hair coat because that winter hair coat could either be hiding a lot of ribs or a lot of fat. There's not a lot of way of knowing until you just uh, put your hands on these horses and feel around. The other thing we wanna remember is to make sure we uh, take off the blankets and we um, feel, feel horses and make sure everything's okay underneath that blanket. Um, and this picture, I, I, I had a lot of fun with this picture and there's about a dozen safety issues you can see right off from the get-go in this picture uh, with the poor fencing, uh, horses fighting over the fence, grabbing each other's halters, um, all doing this in a blanket, um, really a trippy kind of a picture. But I, um, uh, it does illustrate that uh, we need to take our blankets off of horses um, if we want to really know what they look like underneath. So that leads us into um, what are the feeding requirements of horses in the winter? And what I'm really gonna focus on is the forage requirements um, because that uh, is going to be what we wanna really optimize, especially during the winter when we're trying to keep horses warm. So horses will consume about two to 3% of their body weight per day in dry matter intake. Uh, and that's gonna be based on uh, their uh, metabolism. Some horses run really low, there are real easy keepers, so they're gonna be closer to that 2%. Um, and then other horses are gonna be real high energy, uh, maybe we're working them really hard, or uh, they're in early lactation of their broodmare, so their, um, their requirements are gonna be closer to that 3% uh, of dry matter um, for their body weight. So basically that means if we take an average 1,000 pound horse, uh, that horse is gonna need to eat about 20 to 30 pounds in dry matter uh, intake. And the reason we talk about dry matter is that's the only way we can really compare horses intake, especially if they're eating uh, fresh forage versus hay. 
So rule two then is horses should receive at least one and a half to 2% of their body weight in forage a day. And that can go on up. Um, but at the very minimum, we want to see them eat about one and a half to 2% of forage per day. So again, if we go back to that thousand pound horse, that means that they can eat uh, 15 to uh, 20 pounds of, uh, of uh, hay uh, each day. Wench, if we're looking at a 60 pound uh, uh, hay uh, bale, that's gonna last that horse about uh, three, three days. Um, and rule three is we want to maximize the forage in a horse's diet and minimize high starch meals. And we do that to uh, decrease the risk of ulcers, decrease the risk of colic, and decrease the risk of uh, metabolic syndromes uh, in the horse. So if, I, if you can see this uh, horse uh, feeding uh, pyramid, uh, basically we want to always strive to optimize forage in the horse's diet, uh, minimize grain, so we're feeding grain as needed. We're starting uh, with the base of our diet being the forage. That's where the horse is gonna get most of their uh, energy requirements. Uh, we may need to uh, top that off with some of our, our high energy uh, uh, horses uh, with some grain. And then we're just gonna supplement as needed. If you're feeding a, a really good uh, commercial grain uh, in your diet, that's uh, developed specifically for your horse's individual requirements, uh, then chances are you won't need to supplement on top of that. That uh, commercial grain, uh, if fed in the right amount, will uh, have enough um, uh, vitamins and minerals, uh, protein and energy uh, that you need uh, for your horse's intake. So uh, if we're looking at uh, focusing on forage in the winter, um, there's some, a lot of good rationale for why we want to uh, feed forage. Um, first of all, it satisfies the horse's desire to chew. Uh, if your horses are going from pasture uh, to winter hay, this becomes really important to keep their boredom down. Um, probably as is important for a horse in the stall to try to decrease their uh, boredom and reduce the amount of stereotypy type behaviors we might see, like uh, stall pacing or uh, cribbing or wood chewing. Um, also, just the process of, uh, of eating hay or eating uh, pasture um, will help relax horses. Eating forage in the diet also improves the dental health for horses, and that's based on the way horses uh, will chew uh, forage versus how they chew uh, grain. Uh, it provides a more even dental wear. And then also because horses are chewing longer to uh, ingest uh, forage, they're gonna increase their saliva production, which will actually help uh, the gut health of the horse. So the more uh, saliva over a longer period of time uh, and a more consistent uh, amount of time uh, that a horse can have, the healthier their gut is uh, because their, um, their stomach acids will be a, uh, be a little bit more balanced and, uh, and lower uh, than um, if they're on a high grain diet. Another factor with uh, forage is uh, just the act of, uh, of taking in forage um, and digesting forage through um, uh, the heat of fermentation uh, will increase the amount of heat that the horse produces. And that increased heat over a longer period of time uh, will keep the horse warmer during the winter. Another aspect of uh, feeding uh, forage is it helps retain water in the gut. So it will uh, ultimately help with the um, hydration of the horse. 
So if we look at how a horse uh, digests uh, uh, high starch uh, grains like corn, uh, they're gonna digest uh, a corn um, very quickly, and it's primarily gonna be digested in this foregut. So we're gonna have a rapid rate of passage. Uh, it'll digest uh, fairly quickly, um, and it's not gonna create as much heat, body heat as opposed to uh, feeding a horse forage. And I've got this uh, bale of hay in the hindgut of this horse, but you know, obviously uh, horses are gonna be slower to take in uh, forage. It just takes them a lot longer to uh, eat forage as compared to grain. Um, and the process of passing that forage through to the hindgut and the slow process of microbial fermentation as it breaks down the cellulose and the hemocellulose of the fibers of the hay um, are gonna create a lot more body heat uh, for that horse. Um, so that's one of the main reasons uh, we suggest to, if you need to increase uh, uh, your feed uh, to increase energy in the horse during the winter time, that you consider increasing the forage por portion of your ration versus uh, the grain portion of your ration. So again, uh, horses will produce more heat from digesting hay as compared to grain. Um, so, and I remember back uh, uh, when I was a kid uh, in Texas, you know, and I just laugh when I think about um, how we were all worried about our our temperatures in winter in Texas uh, now that I live in Michigan. But we used to always uh, feed our horse extra uh, corn uh, during the winter. And that's kind of a, an old practice, um, but uh, the reality is uh, if you really want to keep your horse warm, uh, you want to consider feeding them more hay in the winter time. And if you want to uh, have them maintain their warmth over a longer feed uh, period of time, usually you're gonna um, add more grass hay versus legume uh, to the horse's diet. Because um, most horses, if they eat a whole lot of alfalfa, are gonna get too fat, um, whereas uh, your grass hay is gonna be a little lower in energy value. Um, so that might make a, a better choice if you want to increase uh, the hay in your horse's diet. So if we look at this uh, with this table, um, this is estimating how much feed uh, per pound per day uh, we need to uh, increase in our in our horse. So. If we, if we look at this chart then, uh, we've got a decrease uh, in temperature at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And we said that for most horses, that's kind of that neutral temperature. So we're not having to change our feed intake yet. But as we drop uh, 10 degrees, uh, for every 10 degrees of temperature drop, we wanna consider adding another two pounds of feed uh, per day uh, to our horse's feed. So uh, probably the best way to do this really for the winter, especially if you're living in really cold areas, is to just feed hay free choice um, during the winter time. And again, grass hay is easier to feed free choice uh, than your legume hay. So, um, some tips on feeding hay during the winter, feed hay free choice, uh, use slow hay nets to uh, prevent a lot of hay wastage. Um, it's okay to feed horses on snow. You know, we usually say don't feed horses on the ground and that's definitely true in the summertime because we wanna prevent sand colic. Um, but in the winter time, I like feeding my horses on top of hay on top of the snow because it gets them outside and gets them more into that uh, grazing mindset. Uh, the only problem we might have uh, on some days is just too windy to do that. So uh, we have to feed them uh, either in a net or back inside or in a uh, hay trough. Um, and then also consider how exercise is impacting your horse's energy needs. Um, 
during the winter, a lot of our horses kind of go into uh, a rest period or semi-retirement just because it's uh, too crazy cold uh, to work with them as much. Um, but if you're one of those uh, hardy individuals that's a winter warrior and you're getting out in the uh, and battling the cold, uh, remember that riding a horse in snow, even if it's a easy trail ride at a walk and a trot, is kind of like you trying to um, walk and jog in really deep sand at the beach. Uh, it takes a lot more energy than you would think. So um, consider how exercise is going to play a part uh, in your we winter feeding program. So when we're looking at the type of hay uh, that we feed in the winter, um, we talked a little bit at the beginning of this presentation about um, impaction colics. And that's where uh, uh, hay uh, or any, any rough feed, uh, but feed can get impacted usually in uh, the large intestines. Uh, where there's a lot of flexures and diameter changes in the intestine. Um, and again, we talked about how uh, if a horse uh, is dehydrated or not drinking enough while they're eating, uh, this can uh, be even a, a bigger problem. And one thing I'll say is uh, when we're choosing hay for the winter, uh, try to pick a good quality hay. Um, if it's extremely coarse and uh, if it's an extremely coarse hay, uh, that might increase your risk of impaction colic. Um, so you want to try to find a hay uh, that's soft. You want to look for a lot of leaf, uh, leafiness in your hay. Uh, it's really important that your hay is clean, um, so free from dust, uh, free from odor. I know one year um, I got a load of hay in and it just really wasn't the quality of hay that I was used to feeding, but it was a really bad hay year in Michigan. So there wasn't a lot of uh, options when it was all said and done. And my horses started out looking pretty good with it and they ate it, but by the end of that uh, winter period, um, they had gone down quite a bit um, uh, based on that uh, quality of hay. And I, I did have to start supplementing a lot more with grain uh, just to keep their um, body condition score at a nice uh, moderate body condition. So it's so much easier keeping your horses um, uh, in a good condition if you start out with quality hay. So it's definitely worth uh, buying early. And if you are in a situation uh, where hay prices are really high uh, or you're just having trouble finding hay, um, especially in the winter time, uh, you can also consider some uh, bagged forage products to try to stretch your hay. Um, I always uh, tell people um, if, you, if it looks like your hay resources are getting low and you don't don't think you're going to be able to get any more hay in before uh, pasture comes back up. Um, try to stretch that hay. Um, and you can stretch your uh, hay uh, with bag products like uh, hay cubes or hay pellets, which is the exact same forage uh, basically that you're feeding, just in a different form. Uh, so hay cubes are going to be about two by two inches. Um, and again, the nutritional value of uh, both hay cubes and hay pellets is going to be very uh, similar to uh, the hay species they represent. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, bagged products that are uh, strictly alfalfa, and sometimes you'll see bagged products that are um, uh, mixed uh, alfalfa and grass hay or strictly uh, grass uh, hay product. Um, if we look at hay cubes, one advantage hay cubes has over hay pellets is they add a little bit more long stem fiber to the horse's gut. And that uh, it takes about an inch to two inches of fiber going through the horse's intestines to really stimulate the gut and uh, make that gut uh, nice and healthy. 
Uh, so that's one thing that you can get from hay cubes that you can't get from uh, hay pellets. Uh, both of these forms are relatively uh, low in dust. Some horses may have difficulties eating hay cubes, especially if they're really tightly packed. Um, so if you have a horse that's prone to choke, that may not be a good alternative. Um, but as you feed hay cubes and hay pellets, basically you replace your, your hay uh, in, weight, in weight. So if you're feeding your horse 20 pounds of hay um, and you need to uh, stretch it out for the winter, you could consider feeding 10 pounds of hay cubes or hay pellets per day and then 10 pounds of uh, hay per day to get back up to your 20 pounds of hay. Uh, so that's one thing you can do with uh, your hay products. Now, complete feeds are a little bit of a different beast. Um, complete feeds include both your hay, so it would be your hay pellets plus concentrate. So your concentrate is your grain portion of your diet. And that's all packed into uh, 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 pellets. Um, if you, there's some, some reasons you might uh, feed a complete feed. Uh, if you have horses that have um, uh, allergies um, or um, are very sensitive to any mold or dust, uh, a lot of times the veterinarian will recommend that you feed a complete feed. Um, if you're trying to keep uh, a horse uh, on a real uh, strict uniform diet and you don't have access to good uh, forage, then again, a complete feed um, may be your ticket. When you feed a complete feed, though, you need to feed it as directed um, because you'll really have to increase the amount of bagged feed that you feed to uh, make sure your horse gets uh, all the nutrients they need. Um, there's also forage alternatives that can help stretch uh, the uh, fiber or the forage in your diet. And probably one of the most popular ones is uh, beet pulp. And while beet pulp is a byproduct of uh, sugar beets, it does not contain sugar in it. So that's one of the reasons we can use beet pulp and horses that we want to feed a really low sugar diet. So some of those uh, metabolic uh, horses, uh, beet, pulp, beet pulp is often used. And we can find it in either a shredded or a pelleted form. It has a very high digestible fiber, so it's a very good energy source. Uh, the protein uh, is a little lower than uh, most of your hays at 8%. Um, it's a good calcium source. Uh, and again, it's basically a no sugar type feed. So advantages of beet pulp, uh, it provides a good fiber and energy source. Some disadvantages would be uh, some horses, if they are, have a tendency to choke, um, maybe some of your older horses with teeth problems uh, won't be able to uh, uh, chew uh, dried beet pulp very well, so you'll need to soak it uh, for about an hour before you feed it. Um, and you can only feed beet pulp at about 20% uh, of the horse's diet, uh, so you don't want to go much higher than that. Another good uh, fiber source uh, in the horse's diet is uh, stabilized uh, rice bran. Um, and rice bran is the outer kernel of rice. Um, and by stabilizing it, that just means it's gonna last longer in storage because it's very high in fat. It also has a pretty decent uh, crude protein uh, level of 13%, which is going to be more than adequate for most horses unless you're looking at really, really young horses or uh, lactating uh, brood mares. It also contains some uh, B vitamins and essential fatty acids. Uh, it's a high fiber source and high energy source. The one thing you have to be careful with uh, for both your rice bran and wheat bran is that since they're both bran products, they have an inverted calcium and phosphorus ratio, which means their phosphorus is higher than their calcium. 
And if you, if you think about uh, for all of our horses, we want the calcium to be at least equal to, if not uh, higher uh, than the phosphorus uh, in the horse's diet. So if you're, if you're feeding either a rice bran or wheat bran, you wanna definitely balance it uh, for calcium. And then finally, I wanted to touch on ration balancers because we've been talking about uh, feeding primarily a hay diet in the winter time. Um, but hay alone, uh, once we harvest, harvest uh, forage out of the pasture, is going to rapidly start losing some of their vitamin content. Uh, they'll lose some of their energy content as well. Um, so you want to make sure that those are replaced in the winter time if you want to keep your horse on a more steady uh, nutritional plane. So one way you can do that without feeding a lot of uh, a lot more energy uh, into the horse is by using a ration balancer. So a ration balancer is a bagged a bagged pellet. Um, that provides uh, all the nutrients that may be low if you're giving your horse more or less an all hay diet or even a hay and oat diet um, without any kind of supplement. Um, so the ration balancer will help uh, to replace uh, any protein uh, in a poor quality hay. Uh, it'll ensure that uh, the vitamins, both your uh, water soluble and, um, and uh, fat vitamins are available to the horse. Uh, it will help balance out the minerals uh, in the horse's diet, especially if you come from a, a selenium def deficient state like Michigan, um, where uh, you're worried about horses uh, receiving enough selenium in their, in their diet. Um, and then it'll also help balance out essential fatty acids. So if you look at the, the feed tag on a typical ration balancer, the crude protein is gonna be really high, as high as 32%. And you'll look at that and you may say, well, I, my horse doesn't need more protein, uh, high protein like that. You know, he's just out in the pasture. Uh, but what you have to remember is because you're feeding a ration balancer, usually in extremely small quantities, about half to one pound, depending on your horse's needs, uh, that high protein that's, in, that's uh, in that pellet is going to be um, uh, balanced out by the hay in your diet. Uh, so basically, you're just adding a little, a little bit more protein to the horse's diet. And if, let's say, the, the uh, horse's hay by itself was about a 9% uh, percent protein, by adding half a pound of this ration balancer, you're going to move the total amount of protein that your horse is getting uh, back up to about a 12% protein ration. Uh, total that uh, that's where most adult horses uh, should probably be. Um, the other thing about the protein though is it's also going to be high in lysine and lysine is one of our essential amino acids for the horse and basically what that means is it's a high quality amino acid and if a horse is getting enough lysine in their diet then we usually assume that they're getting enough overall protein and a high quality protein uh, in their diet. Uh, these uh, pellets, again, are gonna balance out your calcium and your phosphorus in your diet, uh, as well as provide enough vitamin A, uh, vitamin E, and selenium. So with that then, uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, what we've talked about today, uh, as far as uh, some good uh, winter feeding tips, uh, just make sure you pay attention uh, to your water supply in the winter. Don't let it freeze up. Uh, try to make sure that it's comfortable uh, for the horse to drink, especially if you have uh, older horses uh, that are starting to have uh, worn down teeth. 
um, body condition your score at least uh, every other week by putting your hands on them. Um, I've known um, some really good, uh, really good outfits uh, that have messed uh, a horse and a herd um, just because of the, uh, the uh, winter hair coat where they'd bring the horses in and they'd realize that this one horse had really gone way, way down in their body condition score. But just looking out uh, while you were feeding horses in a herd, you couldn't really tell because you couldn't see underneath that winter hair coat. So it's really important to monitor body condition scoring during the uh, winter months. Also, uh, provide your hay free choice. Uh, we talked a little bit about ensuring that you have a good quality hay, um, free from mold and dust that might uh, 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 be problematic for horses uh, with respiratory problems. Um, stretch your hay if needed with uh, either bagged forage or high fiber alternatives. And then if you are feeding primarily a hay diet, uh, uh, consider using a ration balancer uh, throughout the winter months to ensure that your horse gets a real even uh, nutrition going from um, summer to winter. So with that, are there any questions? Uh, we have one question right now in the Q&A, and uh, the question is kind of going back to um, using hay nets to yeah. uh, re reduce uh, wastage of, of hay. And um, they're just asking, is there a significant difference between slow feeding and what they're calling clean feeding based on the size of the mesh in the hay bag? So what they're saying is, you know, about a one inch to one and a half inch mesh is typically slow feeding. Um, whereas two inch to two and a half inch provides more clean feeding. Um, so do you have any suggestions in terms of, you know, kind of the size of the mesh for a hay bag? You know, I think, uh, I think that that's going to be up to you and your horse. Um, I, I, I kind of like the slow net feeders um, uh, for, for most horses, um, especially if they're in a stall. Uh, I think it's even more important um, just because what we're looking for is uh, keeping those horses uh, eating for as long as possible or trying to eat forage for as long as possible so we can uh, keep a really consistent saliva production going on in the horse and that in turn is going to help uh, decrease um, uh, ulcers in the horse's stomach. Um, and if we're looking at winter time, just the process of a horse uh, chewing and eating over a long period of time uh, is going to just uh, 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 increase the time that they're uh, uh, manufacturing heat uh, through heat of fermentation of the forage. But I, I think it's, I don't, I don't have a preference myself. Um, I think it's whatever works for you and your horse. All right. Um, our next question um, is uh, around oats. And uh, the question is, I'm feeding oats. Uh, what nutrients are they getting? Are they getting? And then um, also uh, kind of combining a couple questions here, could you talk a little bit about whole oats versus rolled oats? Okay, sure. Um, and oats is a really nice uh, grain to feed. Um, it's, uh, it's right at about the right protein level for uh, most horses, um, around 12% for a good quality oat. Um, it's a high fiber because it has a real fibrous hull. If you compare, uh, you know, the real slick coat of uh, corn, uh, which is just a really high starch grain because it doesn't have a, a fibrous coat uh, to where uh, to um, uh, a, a kernel of uh, oat, uh, you can feel that uh, fibrous coat. So from that standpoint, it's uh, considered to be a lower starch grain than say as compared to uh, barley or corn. Um, so from a, a grain perspective, oats is, is a really nice grain to feed. Uh, 
you want to definitely balance out uh, for your vitamins and minerals as uh, when you're feeding a uh, uh, let's say a straight uh, oat and hay ration um, again if I was feeding just an oats and hay uh, ration then I would probably uh, look at potentially investing in a ration balancer and using that as almost kind of a, a top dress or just another good all-purpose vitamin mineral supplement that I was happy with uh, just to ensure the horse was getting enough uh, salt in its diet, uh, that we were balancing out the lysine of the diet, um, as well as um, some of the other vitamins and minerals. Uh, as far as rolled oats uh, versus whole oats, um, that's probably more important in horses if they're starting to have some chewing difficulties. Um, the purpose in rolling an oat is to increase the digestibility of that oat. Uh, but the uh, process of rolling oats only increases the digestibility by a few percentage points uh, for most horses. So it may not be that um, um, cost effective, especially if rolled oats cost uh, a bit more than uh, your whole oats. Um, so that's, a, again, another personal preference. Now, if you have an older horse uh, or even a really young horse, then I think rolling oats makes a lot of sense. Uh, but for the average horse, it may not be necessary. Hey, our, our next question um, is uh, about this time of year, and it, as it starts to get warmer, my horse gets something like dandruff. And is there anything I can feed to help with that? Well, I want to congratulate you on living someplace where mid-February it's starting to get warmer because <laughs> <laughs> our temperatures are doing nothing but continuing to drop here in Michigan. So congratulations on that. Um, boy, as far as uh, dandruff, um, and I guess my uh, one question would be, are you blanketing your horse? Um, and I and I, I, I think I know what you mean. The horse has a little bit of dry skin. You know, the one thing I would consider potentially uh, for your horse is to um, feed a little bit more fat in the horse's diet. Um, and you could do that uh, by just top dressing with a little corn oil if you wanted to. Um, and not, not even that much, you know, start out really low with uh, a few tablespoons each feeding and maybe work your way up to a quarter of a cup each feeding and see if that helps make a difference uh, in your horse's hair coat and skin. Um, other than that, um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head um, that might be helpful with that, uh, except for potentially just a lot of good grooming and stuff to try to stimulate those coat oils. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys listening may have some uh, tips on that uh, dry skin effect that you see kind of when you're transitioning in seasons. All right. We Next, we've got a couple questions dealing with water. Um, the first one is, what is the ideal winter water temperature? <laughs> oh, now you've stumped the chump. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll post that on Facebook. It, to be real honest, I'm terrible with numbers. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a real temperate temperature. Um, so it's not excessively warm. Uh, I want to say anywhere between that uh, 60, 70 kind of range uh, is just fine. I think what you're trying to do is uh, not to get it, not to let it get uh, 50 and below to where it just might be harsh on a horse's teeth. But right. I will double check on that because uh, the number is just not uh, coming up to me right now. You know, just a, I did a quick search in um, University of Minnesota Extension, uh, Cooperative Extension. They suggest um, between 45 and 65. Yep, that sounds so, right. Yep. That sounds right. Um, the next question uh, uh, relating to water, um, do you suggest putting powdered electrolytes in their water to get them to drink more in the winter? And this is someone who is in Florida. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I... Uh, 
Not necessarily. I think I would probably just go to the uh, table salt myself, but if it works for you, you know, if you try that and it works for you, then I think that that would be fine. Uh, I wouldn't do it myself just because I think over time it'd be pretty expensive <laughs> and I'm a little bit of a uh, feeding horses on a budget kind of person. I think the, uh, the table salt is going to get you to the same place for a lot cheaper. Um, but if it's working for you, you know, and you can see a significant uh, uh, increase in water intake, then you're not going to hurt the horse at all. All right, we just have a couple more questions here. Um, one is if you have heard of the hay hut for free choice forage um, and particularly with the integrated net system. I have, I have, and, and primarily through my colleagues in, um, in Minnesota. So, um, and I think the hay hut uh, uh, works well. Um, if you have horses uh, with any hint of respiratory disease, there may be a little bit of concern uh, uh, with horses with their, um, uh, as they're uh, eating inside that hut. Um, but I do know that it uh, really helps as far as if you're feeding horses and with round bales especially or uh, bulk feeding, uh, it really helps to decrease waste and uh, from a rain standpoint, uh, keeps your hay dry over time. So, uh, but I myself don't have a lot of um, experience using them. All right, uh, another one last question here. So uh, recommended feed for horses um, with Cushing's and laminitis here in the winter, any special considerations? Well, I think um, everything we talked about today uh, with the high forage diet um, is helpful. High forage, low starch diet uh, with both of those conditions. Um, uh, you can utilize uh, fat, you know, unless you're talking about ponies. I never recommend uh, feeding uh, high fat diets to horses or to ponies, but if you have a, a cushions or laminitic horse uh, that's on the thin side, um, you want to increase the quality of your, of your hay, um, have your hay checked for sugar content, uh, try to find a species that's a little lower in sugar if you can. Uh, if you need to feed a uh, grain, make sure that you uh, work with one of the uh, uh, low starch uh, type uh, rations or commercial products that are out now. Um, and usually those will have the higher fat in there so that your horse can uh, get adequate energy. Um, but there's, there's so many uh, targeted feed products out nowadays to where if you need to feed more than just your hay uh, and the ration, there's some great commercial uh, products out there that are specific for those uh, metabolic horses or Cushing's horses. All right, well, it looks like that's, um... Those are all the questions that we have so far. And I see we're a little bit over our one hour time mark. So I think uh, we're gonna wrap up here a little bit. Um, do wanna mention a couple things. Uh, when we close out the webinar today, you are gonna be directed to a uh, survey. And if you could just take a few minutes and complete our evaluation, give us a little bit of feedback on the webinar today and give us some ideas for future topics, uh, we would really appreciate it. I mentioned at the beginning that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted up on our YouTube uh, channel and on our website uh, here um, by the end of this week. And uh, with that, um, I would like to thank Dr. Skelly for presenting with us uh, this afternoon and uh, thank all of you for uh, participating as well. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out.